We are beginning a brand new series today. We're starting a brand new series in the book of Habakkuk. I'm pretty sure you didn't read that recently. I am quite certain that was not your devotional book of this morning. I, I, here's the deal. I don't even know how to pronounce it, all right? Because I say Habakkuk, everyone else says Habakkuk. That just sounds wrong to me, but right, I don't know. And there's so much about this book that we don't really know. In a moment, I'm gonna ask you to turn to it. Nobody even knows how to find it, right? So we're gonna have to talk about that in a moment, but we have a brand new series, which the whole book is only three chapters, but because of my spiritual gift, <laughs> it's a seven part series, <laughs> right? Everybody's got a spiritual gift, my spiritual gift. Make things longer, praise God, right? All right, so we're gonna do a seven part series. We are in part one, and I entitled this whole series the Ever Present King series. Because when we look around our world, it is very tempting to think that Jesus somehow has stepped off the throne. He never steps off the throne. He was the king, is the king, will always be the king. He didn't go anywhere. We have an ever-present king. Yeah, amen? Yeah. But wow, it sure gets confusing looking out into the world. So we're going to have a series listening to this man who was looking at his world like we look at it today. And he was going ballistic with the injustice that he was seeing around him. And he was crying out, God, don't you care? Why am I the only one that seems to be concerned about this stuff? God, I pray and I pray and I pray and nothing seems to change. Have you ever felt like that? Well, we're gonna try to talk through and make it very personal as we go through this series. I think it's very appropriate for today. But we are, of course, in the year of wisdom. That means that we're going to take a book maybe you haven't read before, and we're gonna to try to open it up so it can become a book that you can personally study. We're gonna take concepts like injustice and turn them around and take a look at it through a new lens. We all need to have soft hearts to say, God, what are you saying to me? What is my part in all this? How can I partner with you to transform my world? That's kind of the idea. So. We're going to jump right into it, and let's find out, who is this guy, Habakkuk? Um, here's the deal. We know almost nothing about him. We know nothing more than what is in his book. He's clearly a prophet, seems to be a poet, and maybe has musical skills. That's it. That's like all we got, right? But we can discern some things about the context that makes his book make sense. So here's a little bit of history stuff, because really, it doesn't matter who the guy is, it matters the message that's coming through him. Can we agree with that? Here's what that means. We should not be so impressed by the prophet, but by the voice of God speaking through that prophet. We should not be so impressed with the pastor but more the Holy Spirit ministering through that pastor. Y'all tracking with me? It's not the individual, it's the God moving through that individual. That should always be what we're focused on. So let's talk a little history context. If you're a note taker, you might wanna write some of this down. It is approximately 640 BC. That's 2,600 years ago. We're going into ancient Middle Eastern history. Israel had been divided North and South, about 270 years before this. We always talk about our civil war in America. There was a North and a South. That's old news to Israel. Israel had already done that thousands of years before. They split North and South. They didn't like each other. They hated each other. They had different kings and different prophets. The North was known as the proper name of Israel. The South was known as the name of Judah. They had very different lives. Well, what happened was, is that both had been warned 
that they were off the rails. They needed to get back in alignment with God. If they did not, God was going to use enemy nations to bring judgment upon them and remove them from their land. Now, to a Jew, their whole history is about land and getting into the land. The idea of being removed out of the land is tantamount to the end of the world. They were being warned, if you do not fall back in line, if you do not become the nation I built you to be, then I am going to remove you from your land. Well, a nation, a mean, nasty nation at the time, now they've transformed over the years, but a mean, vicious nation called the Assyrian Empire was the world-dominating leader. God used them in 722 B.C., to come in and wipe out the north. They literally killed thousands upon thousands upon thousands and then took a bunch off into exile. They cleaned them right off the face of the planet. Now, the south, of course, who didn't like the north, they cheer, yeah, right on, right on. Now, no, we don't want our people off this, we, but we're still here. Y'all were worse than we were, so you all deserve it. And God said, whoa, 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 whoa. You guys are on the same track as they're on. I've given you more time, but I need you to turn the boat around. So all these prophets were being raised up. People like Habakkuk and the same people that lived during his time were guys like Nahum and Zephaniah and Jeremiah. All these names maybe that you're familiar with, with the prophet Jeremiah, they all lived at the same time, trying to give the same message. Turn it around, turn it around, turn it around. Well, the whole world situation began to shift. The Assyrian Empire began to diminish, and a new empire began to arise. They were led by a famous general that we probably know his name, most of us. His name was Nebuchadnezzar. Now, he ran the whole army for his dad, who also had a stupid name, <laughs> Nabo Palasser, right? So, needless to say, not a great naming town, all right? So, his, the general was winning the wars. Now, eventually, his dad would pass away, and he would assume the throne, and of course, that is the guy who, Daniel, was that whole scenario with Daniel working with Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire. The Babylonians were rising up, Assyrians were going down, and this prophet Habakkuk learned that God was going to use the Babylonians to bring judgment on the south, and they too were going to get wiped out, and he went ballistic. God, what do you think you're doing? How dare you use a pagan nation to correct your children? How dare you? And while I'm complaining, why are you always letting the bad guys get away with stuff? Man, I, it seems like everywhere I look, someone doing something bad is advancing in the world, and the good guys are always getting crushed. God, why, I, if you're on the throne, why are you paying attention to this? Why am I the one always having to give you the news feed? Don't you care? Have you ever felt like that? Hmm. Why was he so angry? Fill in the blank on the sheet in front of you. Is this, a broken world is maddening. A broken world is maddening. This is not how God wanted it. We look around and we see broken nations run by broken people doing broken things. We're hurting each other all the time we're bringing in leaders that have no business being there, and we're suffering the cause of it all the time. But that's not how God designed it. Hmm. Let's make it more personal, shall we? All right, so it's one thing to read about history and the injustice of people like Stalin and Hitler and things like that, and you kind of go, yeah, that, those were terrible times. That kind of stuff is still going on in our world today. Now, I won't get into it too, too much here, uh, and, and I don't wanna instantly cause everyone to jump into some weird political mindset, so we're gonna keep out for a moment from our nation. 
But I think that we can all agree that Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, is probably not a great guy. Can we, uh, most of us can agree with that. Intriguingly, did you know that he is number six on the richest list of the people on the planet? Did you know that Vladimir Putin's net worth is $70 billion? Personal net worth. Is there anything odd about that? That you go, wait a second. You're the president of a nation. You shouldn't be the sixth richest man in the entire world. Something's not right there. Well, in the same way, did you know that uh, number 48 on the world's most powerful people that are shaping the planet is Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, the head of the Sinaloa cartel. He's a Mexican drug lord, 48th most powerful person on the planet is a drug guy? Come on. Well, let's make it a little bit more detailed. Anybody ever heard of Silvio Berlusconi? Silvio Berlusconi, uh, maybe not. You will. He was the 31-year owner of AC Milan. AC Milan is uh, a soccer team. It is the fourth most winning soccer team on the planet. They have had so many different titles. So Silvio bought them in 1986 for 8 million euro. Now that sounds like an awful lot of cash because remember the euro is more expensive than the dollar. So 8 million euro. He just sold it to Chinese investors for 740 million euro. Well, that's quite an investment. From 1986, you hold something for 31 years, you buy it for 8 million, you sell it for 740 million. So AC Milan, is that what he's always famous for? No, nope. you're gonna find out he's actually more famous than that. Let me tell you his story. In 1997, in rising up as a wealthy media tycoon, he was sentenced to 16 months to jail for accounting fraud at his company Finivest, but that sentence was suspended. In 1998, he was sentenced to two years and four months in prison and fined $5.6 million for corruption and illegal party financing, but that was overturned the next year. Also in 1998, he was sentenced to two years and nine months for bribing tax inspectors, but that was thrown out in 2000. In 2001, he became Italy's prime minister. <laughs> Oops. He won with 18.5 million votes. Okay, so you are known as a corrupt businessman and you become brought in as the prime minister. Okay, in 2006, he was put on trial for judicial corruption. He also stood trial for tax fraud, but that case was suspended for a couple years. Meanwhile, he was voted in as prime minister for the third time. Doesn't matter what you do, you just keep rising. It resumed in 2012, he was convicted of tax fraud, was given four years in prison and barred from public office for five years. But after the appeal sentence, it's reduced to one year of community service in a nursing home. <laughs> Is that who you want around your mother? <laughs> in 2011, with all his various marriages and everything, he became famous for having prostitute parties. Well, that became a big problem because he then was on trial for sex with an underage girl prostitute. He was found guilty of it was found guilty of the abuse of power, was sentenced to seven years in prison, but the appellate court overturned it. In 2013, he was indicted for bribery of a senator. He was expelled from parliament, but only because it was 192 votes to 113. He was convicted of bribery, sentenced to three years in prison, but due to the statute of limitations, served no prison time. Okay, how frustrating is that? I'm sorry, he's how wealthy? Things keep rolling for him. He continues to succeed no matter what he does. 
If any of us had any of those things on our record, it would be the primary downfall of our lives. It's merely a hiccup to him. Our planet is full of corruption, genocide, abuse of power from world leaders. How did God let them get in power? And why in the world is he letting them stay there? Have you ever asked that question? How about this? How did Harvey Weinstein become so wealthy and influential that he could abuse women like that? Why can famous athletes rape and abuse women but still play on Sundays? Why can entertainers and musicians do all the drugs, all the assaults, all the hating, all the abusing they want but continue to rise in the charts? Why are some of the most successful businessmen the ones who are the greediest, the most arrogant, the ones who lie, cheat, and steal their way to the top. Why does it feel like injustice is everywhere? Let's take it one more step closer. You have some injustice in your life, yes. There are some people that have felt that in their marriage, someone had left and they had taken everything. You spend every day looking back and talking about how unfair that was. You've prayed about it. Why does it always seem everybody gets away with everything, right? This is how Habakkuk felt. This injustice, this agitation, this holy irritation. God, it's not right. Why are you letting it go like this? I thought you were king. Why are we praying and praying no movement? Why are we trying to move the dial politically and nothing's changing? Why is everything sliding and then the bad guys get rewarded? Ah, that agitation filled this man's heart and God had something to say to him and he has something to say to us today. Would you turn with me to the book of Habakkuk? Now, if it helps, it's right between Nahum and Zephaniah. <laughs> okay. All right. In your Bible, it's probably around page 785, 785. Uh, here's the deal. It's at the end of the Old Testament. Uh, a little tiny book. Once again, three chapters. But we're going to begin the study right here in verse 1. Habakkuk 1.1. 1, 1. This is the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. Okay, what's an oracle? I mean, right, I get it. If you saw the Matrix movie, you know that, uh, you know what an oracle. Okay, here's an oracle. An oracle is a revelation from God, a message from God. But it says that he saw it. For most of us, we think of prophecy or revelation from God as something that you hear or something that is impressed upon your heart. What do you mean he saw it? Well, it's, God has revealed himself to mankind in a variety of ways. Sometimes it's visions. Sometimes it was dreams. What's the difference? One, you're awake. One, you're asleep, right? God has done things auditory. God has done things on impression. God has done things through nature and circumstance. God communicates to his people. So what he saw I have no idea. But the message came across relatively clear, and he began to write it down. He heard from the king of kings. And you go, man, that would be so awesome. Man, really, God, like, gives you a directive. He tells you something so clear that you're, like, writing it down word for word, and you think that would be awesome. Uh, real quick caveat on that. The word oracle is translated prophecy two times. That's why you're going to think of it in terms of prophecy. 56 times it's translated burden. What does that mean? It means it might not be as cool as you think it means. Here's why. When the king of kings speaks, it demands action. You do not consider it, you do it. That's how it works. The unfortunate thing is that as we are reading the Word of God, we're still reading the Word of God as if it's an opinion. It's not an opinion. It's God has spoken. Now, we need to do all our work to understand what it means or what it says, but once we know what it says, it is actually a mandate for living. 
but we still seem to think that, ah, I'll consider it. No, we'll live by it because that's God talking. All right. So he was hearing from God. Do you hear from God? Here's my argument. I believe that all God's kids are hearing from him so often that you're not even tracking it as God. I think that it is so common, it no longer receives any honor. And you're like, what, what, what are you talking about? I, I believe that God communicates to his people. Is that true? Yeah, we're going to talk about prophecy. He is a prophet. What does that mean? Okay, so let me give you an idea. Because if you come from a charismatic camp, right, or a Pentecostal background, you hear prophecy and you're like, yep, that's how it rolls. That's awesome. I've got a couple words. They were super encouraging in my life. I got words for people. We need to do a whole lot more of that at Bridgeway, which I would wholeheartedly agree. If you come, praise God. Woo! If you come from a conservative background, you have this mindset. There were prophets, and if they got it wrong, they were stoned, right? So that's kind of your background. You're like, hey, there's are some pretty hardcore rules, right? Like Isaiah wasn't going to mess around. And you have these two different backgrounds. So when people talk about prophecy today, there's a big discrepancy, a big chasm between them. Why? Ah, let me see if I can bridge that gap for you. There was a fundamental shift in how God interacts with mankind throughout time. Here's what I mean. In the Old Testament, the Father was the primary member of the Godhead engaging with mankind. Remember, the God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, the Father spoke from a distance. Why? Well, partly because we asked him to. When he was speaking to Israel, we said, we don't want to hear you talk to us anymore. Talk through somebody else. And God said, all right, we'll do that. The other thing is that we have sinful lives that were separating us from God. So he would speak through select individuals. That was the only Bible you had. There was no writings. There was no anything else, right? We always kind of get this, well, we had the first five books of the Bible. I think you've probably learned more from all the rest of it than just the first five books of the Bible, right? Okay, so you had living Bibles. God would select one person or a few people per generation, and he'd say, I'm giving you my hardcore word. Do not play games with that. You tell them exactly what I tell them to tell what I tell you to tell them, and nothing more, nothing less. It's the only truth they are operating off of. You don't play with it. You don't distort it. You don't manipulate it. If you do, I'll kill you. That's pretty severe, is it not? Well, yeah, because it was the only revelation of God special to mankind. But then something happened. The second person of the Trinity, we know him as Jesus Christ. He comes down and changes everything. Why? Because not only did he die for our sins and alter supernature and nature, but when he died, there used to be a curtain that separated God from man. Only the high priest used to be able to go in there. When Jesus died, the curtain was torn by God from the top to the bottom, and now everything that was hidden behind the shield has now gone worldwide. Now, all of a sudden, there's accessibility by normal people to approach God. That when Jesus died for our sins, when he made us sons and daughters of God, he fundamentally changed the internal being and gave us the ability to be born again into God's family. And God began to communicate with his children directly. There was no longer a mediator. There was no longer one select individual. God now talked to all of his kids. But it didn't stop there. Yeah, amen. It didn't stop there. 
Then the second person of the Trinity went back to the right hand of the Father, tag team, touched the Holy Spirit, and said, you go. The Holy Spirit comes flying in and indwells the very hearts of those individuals that had been purified by Jesus, sets up a personal holy of holies that you carry around in your chest, and now you not only have full dialogue, but you have constant communication coming from God straight through your heart into your mind. Amen. So how did prophecy change in every way? Before it was, thus saith the Lord, one person has it, everyone has to deal with it. Now the Holy Spirit is speaking in all of his children and we're all now interacting with each other and trying to share words from the Lord with each other. We're now praying over each other. We're receiving from each other. The Holy Spirit now moves in community. Let me give you an example. The power of a confirming word of God. So last weekend, I was out in the lobby hanging out with Banning and, and uh, I was, he was talking with one group, I was talking with another. And then when everything kind of died down, a young lady came up to me. Now, I, I knew her. Uh, it's not like we were very close, but I know her, and I know her by sight. She said, Pastor, as I was leaving, I felt like the Lord was saying to come pray for you. I was like, hey, bring it, right? <laughs> Any extra prayer is awesome. Let's do that. She said, um, what should I pray for? And, and I said, well, I, I don't know. I got, I got some issues on my heart. Uh, that are really heavy. I've been dealing with a lot of societal issues and trying to sort things out. And I said, I don't, I just need some clarity there. I'm having a hard time figuring out what to do. I said, I also have a speaking engagement this evening where I'm gonna be speaking to another church and doing leadership training and I just hope that what I say is right. She said, all right, well, I was getting the word clarity, so that's good. And I said, all right, cool. So she starts to pray for me. She prayed along, but along the way, she said two very unique things. One of them, she said, Lord, as I'm praying, I just feel like it's the same idea of clearing a, a muddied glass, that, that God somehow you would cleanse out so that Pastor Lance could see clearly through to do what he needs to do. Then later on in the prayer, she said, and when he speaks to this other church, would you make it like honey? on his lips to be able to speak out the truth of God. Okay, now, she wraps up her prayer and I, I said, hold on, I know how uncomfortable it is to come up to the senior pastor and pray over him, right? The idea that you did that is crazy cool. I said, so first of all, thank you for your prayers, but I need to give you some instant confirmation because you're gonna go away and go, that was super awkward, right? <laughs> like I'm all, hey, pastor, honey on your lips, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I said, let me give you some confirmation. Two things happened this last week, literally days ago. Number one, and I won't go into the whole story, but number one, I have this awesome dog. She's four years old, her name's Bella. She's a King Charles Cavalier. Super cute little princess dog. She has decided she is not going to use her dog door. Uh, now it's one of those plastic doors that swing out. She has her own door to get out into the, anyway, bottom line is she wasn't using it. So I, as a good owner, got down on my hands and knees <laughs> to take a look and find out what's going on with the door. Now I looked and I went, oh, she can't even see through it to get to the other side because the door's all messed up. And I was like, oh, it probably doesn't matter. It's been scratched. Cause every time she hits the door, she hits it with her little hand or paw, whatever it's called. <laughs> her hand. I've made her totally into a person. Okay. <laughs> she reads too. No, she doesn't. So I was like, there's no point in clearing it. Well, then I thought, well, as a good owner, I needed to tr try. So I end up rub. well, come to find out the whole thing is coated with grime. By the time I clean it off, there's very few scratches and actually it's now clear to see through because she didn't want to push her nose through because she didn't know what was on the other side. But now that it was clear, she was willing to walk through that door. Okay, really? <laughs> that just happened right before she's praying that the glass would be cleaned and all this stuff. Oh, okay, she doesn't know that. Here's the other thing. I had uh, an appointment to do a book 
interview on my master's mind book with a company in Chicago. They said, prepare a verse that we can talk about that's been on your heart a lot lately. So I prepared Ezekiel's call. You know what that's about? God gives him a scroll, tells him to eat it, it tastes like honey, and then he's able to present the word of God. That interview canceled. I just prepped the verse, but there was no interview. It got postponed. That happened three days before she prayed over me. Here's my point. God was always talking to me, but the idea that another believer would come up and pray over me and confirm what God was saying to me when I was crying out for God's clarity, for her to hit and ping on very specific things, not having any idea what's going on in my world, made me feel like God sees me. Do we need more of that? Oh yeah, we do. We do. But let me caution us on something. When we have connections with the Lord, the reason why prophecy changed in the New Testament is because the Holy Spirit is talking and it says, man, everyone's going to have a word, bring it in church. Now, if you got something corporate, that we got to slow down, right? We can only do maybe like three of those, blah, 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 right? But individuals different. He said, but when you bring it out, you need to bring it out in a way where everyone can consider it. Because here's what we're not good at, listening to God. We're all so busy and confused and distracted. Most of us don't take any time to learn to dial in to hear God's voice clearly. So we're not a very good filtering system. But you're supposed to present it out and then say to the other person, well, man, you gotta pray through that. That could have been totally bogus, sorry about that. Like, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to track. So here's a good rule of thumb for Bridgeway. When you are praying, when you feel just a strong impression from God to share for somebody else, here's what I'd like you to do. Please do not use the phrase, God told me you need to. Please don't do that. Even if that's what you think. Because here's what it does. It sets it up for an improper response. There's no considering. If God already told you, what am I going to say? What, am I going to argue with you? No, he didn't. Yeah, I did. No, we didn't. I, okay, please don't set it up that way. Here's how we set it up at Bridgeway. Man, I feel like the Lord is sharing. And then when you finish, but you need to pray about it and bring it to the Lord. Because I think that sets up a more biblical model by which we are to consider it, match it up against Scripture, do our due diligence, and then pray and listen to the Lord, right? That's what we're supposed to be doing. All right. Having said all of that, here is Habakkuk, a prophet of the old sort, the ordained office of which there were very few. Everything rises, rise, rises and falls on this guy's ability to get this right. Different time, different season. Habakkuk gets an oracle from God. Ready? Verse 2. <laughs> hey, I wonder why it's a seven-part series. Here we go. O Lord, he said, how long shall I cry for help and you won't hear me? Or cry to you violence and you don't save? It's interesting where he starts out with a personal name of God of which is translated on our version as Lord. What's intriguing about that is Lord means boss. It's intriguing how many of our prayers start with Lord Jesus, Lord means he's the authority. Why then do we spend the rest of the prayer telling him what to do? <laughs> right? And Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but don't do what I say? Like, I'm, we're having a little confusion here on the titles, right? How long, Habakkuk says, shall I cry for help and you not hear me? This is a praying man. He's praying day in and day out. He's a good guy. Doesn't the Bible say that our prayers are powerful and effective? Doesn't the Bible say that God hears our prayers? Doesn't God say that he moves heaven and earth for his children? Then why am I praying so hardcore and nothing's changing? Boy, I'm sure you felt that, yeah? Why, God? How long do we have to put up with this? 
How long do the bad guys get away with it? Here's the irony. I think that God should have just paused him right there and said, it's funny you ask me how long. I've been asking you guys that for a really long time. How long are you going to go your own way? How long are you going to pretend like I'm just an opinion? How long are you going to pretend like you're the king of the universe when actually I am? How long are you going to turn my paradise, my Eden that I gave you into garbage? How long are you going to mess with my way? Is that what you want to do, Habakkuk? Play the game of how long? How long have you walked away from me? I think we have the wrong idea here, buddy. But Habakkuk's in his self-righteous rage. How long do I cry for justice and you don't do anything about it? What's his point? You don't care enough. You're watching all this. It's not like you don't see it. You get it. The persecution of your people. The homelessness. The poverty. The the sex trafficking. You see it. I'm praying about it. You're not doing anything about it. Why am I the only one concerned here? Is that not an attack on God's nature? Pick it up at verse 3. Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, and justice goes forth perverted. What's his point? God, why is there so much sin right under your nose, and you're not fixing it? You felt like that? God, I want some justice here. Come on. Really? So people get picked on, you don't care. People get used and abused. You don't care. What, does that make me more righteous than you? Here's where I think God should have stepped in and said, excuse me, son. You keep asking me for justice. That is the very thing you do not want. What you want and you keep praying for is corruption. No, I'm not. I'm praying against corruption. Mm. How do you define corruption? Corruption. Well, it's totally unfair. Those guys with power get that benefit. Those people that do not have power don't get that benefit. Oh, I see. So what you've just asked me is to take care of all the sin that they're doing, but not the sin in your life. That's corruption. You want me to bless you, give you space, because you got sin in your life, right? Aren't you the one that's using other people? Aren't you the one being mean to other people? Aren't you the one gossiping? Aren't you the one that's turning your heart away from me? Aren't you the one rebelling? And yet you want me to bring justice on the sin over there, just not on you, yeah? Oh, you see, my son, that's not justice. That's corruption. You see, I don't do that. You see, I have a much bigger plan in play. What's interesting is you want me to give you all the patience in the world. You want me to allow you to have a little bit more time. You want me to, you know, God, you understand, right? Is that what you want for your own sin? But you want me to nail that other guy to the wall. Do you realize there are some people that are praying about you right now? Why are they getting away with it, God? They call themselves a Christian. They rip me apart every day at work. They think they're high and mighty. They're Bible thumping. They got all kinds of corruption in their own lives. God, when are you going to nail your kids to the wall and quit acting like brats? They're praying to me about you all the time. Is that what you want? Justice. You want me to shut you down? Ah, you don't want justice. You want mercy, don't you? Hmm. Here's the problem with the why question. Why, God, why? It's a beautiful question when you really want to know the components The problem is most why questions are a way to impart blame. You don't want to know why. You just want to point out that you want to ask why. Right? Hmm. Everything's falling apart, God. It's all getting worse. Is it? Well, I don't know. Kind of. You see, the only reason you're telling me that is because you see it from a limited point of view. 
So, for example, when the early church got persecuted, it scattered over the planet. You know what I did with that? I took Christianity worldwide. You told me it was getting worse. I told you it was getting better. As long as y'all are peaceful, you're not taking your faith seriously. The minute some pressure comes on, now all of a sudden you're starting to pray a whole bunch. Are you telling me it's getting worse or it's getting better? See, you have all these opinions about why am I allowing that person in power and yet I'm toppling that government. Is it getting worse or is it getting better? When you attack me and tell me that I don't know how to run my universe, you're assuming you do know how to run my universe but you don't. You see, before I sent my son down into your world, Satan used to run this place mostly free of pressures, but I came down and I actually changed everything. I started forcing my kingdom in. I started turning on the lights of all these born-again believers, and they started pushing against darkness. I started watching the fight intensify. Every time you see the fight intensify, you're telling me it's wrong. Are you sure or is it right? You see, it all has to do with your perspective. And, but you think that you have the right perspective. You don't. What you see as injustice is simply that you're not seeing my full plan in effect. I know how to handle this stuff, kids. I got it. I need you to trust me on this one. Yes, the wicked are advancing. Yes, the wicked are ruining everything. Both the wicked outside you and inside you. It's maddening at times, is it not, to live in a world where things are going wrong. But at any given time, there's enough information online to depress us to give up or to encourage us to fight again. It all depends on what you're looking at. For every story you read about the Middle East becoming more unstable, you can read a story about God's revival in the Middle East. For every story that you read about another terrible person elevated to the spotlight, getting all the presence and power and prestige, there's more stories about a Christian doing something quietly so extraordinary that it changes the supernatural world. All depends on what you're looking at. Be careful how you interpret the news because if you're not careful what you see in the news may remove your joy that Jesus put there. Be careful how you read the news because it may replace your hope with despair. But God didn't give you despair. He gave you hope. Please do not allow your lens of the unjust world to steal your blessings that God gave you. That's not what it's for. I get it. It does look so weird and so messed up and, and it's not how God wanted it. But you got to remember, he's not done yet. He's still working. Can I have the prayer team come on up here? Here's what we're going to do as we close out. We're going to pray about the issues amongst our world and our nation. And what I want you to do is I want you to participate. This is interactive. So our prayer team is going to come forward when I say amen, the, the altar is going to be open. But here's what I need you to do. Every time I say something that sounds right to you, and you would pray that same thing to the Lord in your heart or out loud, you just say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Because we're going to pray collectively. Yesterday I was with a church and we were praying about some of the sorrow that the African-American community is suffering right now. And I was watching the prayers rise in such power. I was thinking, how in the world the enemy can stand against this? I have no idea. And I thought, man, we need a lot more of that. Because I think we all worry a lot. I don't think we're praying a whole lot, right? About what's going on in our world. How about we pray, yeah? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we lift to you our world and we ask God that not just in our world, but in our nation, you would bring revival that you would bring revival in our region, that you'd bring revival in our church, that you'd bring revival in our hearts. And God, that you would show us what we need to do to be a part of that. What is our role? 
God, we pray right now for the racial tensions across our region, across our nation, and we ask God for comfort and soothing and understanding and advancement that, Lord, that we do not constantly only have pain, but that we would have solutions as well. God, show us what we need to do. Father, we pray right now for those in our region who are homeless, those across our planet who are filled with poverty. Lord, the little babies that don't have enough to eat. God, we're praying right now for the areas that do not have clean water. That God, that you would make a way, and if that way is through us, through our generosity, through a redistribution of funds, show us how. That God, we do not just point, we want to be a part of it. So help us solve the problems in our society. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray protection over our marriages. That we are being thrashed, that our divorce rate is skyrocketing. There are so many things attacking our covenants. Our family structure is getting rocked in every way. We pray for healing from parents to children and children to parents. We pray for healing among siblings. We pray, God, for the family structure to be healed and united and strengthened that our nation might be strong. God, we pray against all forms of terrorism and persecution in this world. God, whether or not it's young people shooting young people or people blowing themselves up to harm other people, whether or not it is the personal terrorism of our own lives lashing out at our coworkers. God, would you show us how to live different? Would you protect the innocent? God, we come against in Jesus' name all forms of human trafficking. Right here, Lord, in modern day slavery is happening on the 80 corridor. We are one of the big stops on the way to Reno where we buy and sell human beings. God, it is wicked for all of us that are a part of the problem. Would you help us to change? Would you show us solutions? Would you rescue those that are lost? Would you transform the mind of the terrorist, the trafficker, to you, Jesus? God, we pray for the erosion of biblical truth in America, where now it doesn't even matter what you're saying. God, I pray that you would raise up a revival of spiritual truth, that minds would be clarified and sharpened and we would hear you and we would say, yes, God. We pray right now, Father, for all the situations of fear that involve immigration and refugees, that, Lord, their whole lives are filled with panic and fear. We don't know the answers, God. We don't have the solutions. God, would you help us to understand more? But even more than that, God, right now people are afraid. And I pray for calm and soothing and peacefulness. Lord, there is wars going on in this world, and there are families fleeing everywhere. That's not new to you. You see it. You know it. Would you put your loving arms around them and guard them with angels? And finally, Father, there are some walking our streets today in mental illness. Lord, they don't have the meds and they don't have the mindset to take the meds. They're spending their days talking to imaginary people, angry at the world. God, would you supernaturally come alongside them and hold them close? Would you bring a sound mind to the schizophrenic? Would you allow the bipolar to be healed? Would you allow the casting out of anxiety and depression? That God, that you would bring a blanket of peace over our region. Lord, we are your people to stand in the gap and we stand in the gap today and we say your way, God. We praise you in advance in Jesus' name. Amen.